All right, come on. Good morning. Hey, last week my wife got to share for Mother's Day. Come on, did you guys enjoy that? Man, because I'll tell you what, she seemed to really enjoy that. Never again, never again. You know, she was so funny, she told me, hey, I'm going to tell the story of when I caught you flexing in the mirror. And I said, o okay, uh, that's fine, but does it make sense with your message? And she said, oh, I'll, I'll make it work. <laughs> she said, I'll, I'll figure out a way. She's so creative, babe. I just love it. We're, just, we're going to keep doing that. You know, what she didn't tell you, she, my hand, when she took me skydiving, look, normally people, they, they give you a gift or something, right? They don't throw you out of a plane. You know, like my hands were so sweaty and clammy. That was such a fun, fun birthday. Yeah. <laughs> hey, really quickly too, I want to talk about Father's Day. Everybody say 7 a.m. 7 a.m. Father's Day. It's a little bit of an early service, but there's only one. And here's the cool part. We want to take you to the movies. So dads, we want to celebrate you. That means that everyone gets to go to Incredibles 2 for free. That's our gift to you, okay? That's our gift to you. So have, a, you know, come have early service with us. 9 a.m., that movie's going to start on us. Come on, dads. You guys deserve it. Afterwards, your family's going to make you barbecue anyway, okay? You can just do that later, you know what I mean? So, hey, come join us because it will be a lot of fun. Invite your friends and family. Uh, and, and we went into the theater. It's going to be a real fun experience, okay? Hey, open up your Bibles or take out your notes to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, as we start our Ohana Factor series, the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at some of the characters that we need in our lives, the friends and the family that we actually need in our lives in order to do what God has designed us to do. You know, we'll never really get to see the fullness of God's best for our lives in isolation. We won't be able to do it just by ourselves. We need one another. You know what? And I don't know why God made it that way, but he did make it that way. You know, the Bible says that, that the, our, your disciples, that, that God's people will be known by the way that they love one another. That means we have to be close enough to each other to love each other. Amen? That means we have to be close enough each other to bother each other and annoy and to, uh, to frustrate or get angry or even offended. And then we get to walk out forgiveness and grace and mercy. Those are the kinds of friendships that we want. But I feel like there's almost like a friendship crisis in our culture today. It seems like it's more and more difficult uh, to find good, good friends. When I was a kid, it was really easy. I remember one of my friends, uh, uh, David, uh, second grade, I was seven years old. He was playing with a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. And it was awesome. And I said, so uh, you like Ninja Turtles? And he was like, yeah. And that was it. That was it, that we were best friends. That guy's been in my life, his family still does my taxes over 30 years, people. Now this is crazy, because I shouldn't be saying things like, I've had a friend for 30 years. I'm too young to be saying things like that. But here I am. I got friends that I've had for 20, 25, 30 years. Here, another friend that I had was the, the Norin family. They're like my second family just up the street. Well, they had moved in to a neighbor's house that had moved. I think I was maybe five at the time. And that's when they had just come out with those electric, like, uh, four-wheeler, like, cars, you know, like in, like, 87 or something like that. And so I, I charged that thing up and went up the street because some strange people were moving into my friend the Shaw's house. I'm five years old. Look, I took the neighborhood watch very seriously. <laughs> And so I roll up on my big wheels. I go boom, boom, hit the stairs, climb up the thing. I just walk in. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't knock. I'm five years old. I walk in. I said, hey, this is the Shaw's house. Oh my goodness. Who are you? <laughs> We've been best friends ever since. I don't know what that says about either of us. But it seemed like it, those moments, I remember so, they, I mean, when we get together as a family, that's one of those classic repeating family stories when Pat just stormed the gates at five years old and was like, who are you guys? But I've been friends with their children, Evan and Kenny, uh, since I was five years old. 
We've known tragedy. We've known success. We've known uh, us transitioning and going to school. We've known friendship. But the challenge becomes when more and more people are feeling like they don't have close friends. The American Sociological Review says this, 25% of Americans say they don't have one single close and trusted friend. 25, that's one in four, count the row you're next to, one, two, three, that's the guy. That's the girl, okay, that feels like they don't have even one close friend. I feel like there's a friendship crisis in our culture today. But why are friendships declining? Why are they? And on the back of your notes, you can, you can write, you can fill in these blanks. There are some things that I've done in a little bit of the research as I was just preparing my heart for this message. And one of the reasons is increasing work hours. We're seeing friendships decline because of the increase in pressure from work and things like that. Now, we might have great friends, but if our work is demanding so much of us that we don't have time for them, those friendships are going to level out at a certain place. Do you know what I mean? It's like you've known friends for the last few years or 20 years or 30 years, and when you get together, it's awesome. It's like you just pick up where you left off. But without more presence with one another, it becomes difficult to even go that much deeper in friendship. So there's an increase in work hours. There's the rising divorce rates in our country. I mean, we see this, this fragmenting of families and where now you have these dynamics where, well, their friend group now have to pick up their friends and then we don't hang out with them. It's not like we don't like them, but we didn't know what to do. And so then you have their kids and all of those dynamics are at play when you have this kind of fragmentation happening. It's very challenging. How then are we supposed to live out friendships that God wants for us? Here's a one last thing that I think we, are, we haven't even begun to see the true effects, and that's the rise of social media in a digital culture. The increase of, of, of presence in a device instead of face-to-face. -face. The increase in friendships developing thumb-to-thumb instead of face-to-face. -face. Yeah. Come on, this is, we're, we're seeing this challenge right now. Now, we have to acknowledge social media, it, it changes the landscape of friendship. And before everybody, all of us say, well, that's just the young kids thing. Nope, not at all. It's all of our challenge. Most of us now are dealing with technology, maybe it's not social media, where we have to use different softwares on our devices and they begin to consume our time. Now, before you say, well, the social media thing, that's just for kids. Well, the average user on Facebook is between 40 and 45 years old. It's not just the kids, fam. It's you and me. It's when grandma and mom are leaving posts on the kids' wall. And they're like, don't do that. Why are you saying those things? Don't bring up that picture of me when I was a baby. I want to do that so that I can look cute doing it. Nobody does that, okay. <laughs> you know, before, we live in a world where like, like 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, if you called up your friend and was like, hey, hey, check it out, I'm eating steel-cut oatmeal with a banana. <laughs> they'd be like, they'd be like, thank you, I don't care. This phone call's making me late for work. Okay? Hey, bro, I went to this place and I got an acai bowl and it blew my mind. And I'm eating it right now. Now, you have to take a picture of your food. It's like you have to. You know, but you know what I'm talking about. Got to get the lighting. I watched someone, I watched someone for five minutes take a picture of their coffee. I just, I just wanted to walk up and take their coffee. If you're not going to enjoy this, then I will enjoy it for you. Just give me the coffee. You could take a picture of the empty cup. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just venting a little bit. <laughs> venting a little bit. Nobody cared that you went to the gym to go work on your fitness, okay? <laughs> but now everybody knows. Everybody knows. See, the challenge, though, is because in that, that moment, we find a little bit more of an ability to control the situation and the scenario. 
It's like now, instead of just having the highlights of our family on the family album on our coffee table, we present the highlights, the cherry-picked moments of our life to present to all of the world. And they're filtered, and they're curated. We post a picture of ourselves, and we filter it, and we frame it. And digital communication, and connect, it promises such connectivity. But I know for myself, the more I engage with that digital connection, the more my soul craves face-to-face -face interaction. And what we find is that, hey, look, I'm a big fan of social media. We live, if you're in Hawaii, you should be. You live on a rock in the middle of the ocean. There, and there's a big old world out there, you know? My family, still in California, one of the only ways that we can connect consistently is through social media. Whenever we go home to, to our, our hometown of Salinas, California, I always, the, the Norins or, or whoever that I grew up with, please keep posting pictures of your children, no matter if it annoys all of your single friends. Just post and post and post, and so that's why, because we interact and we call and we connect that way. So I'm not opposed to social media or anything like that. I have the Instagram and I have the Facebooks and I go on the interweb. <laughs> but social media should be a supplement, not a replacement. The more I use those kinds of things, the more I realize how much I need real face-to-face -face interaction. Hey, this morning... I'm going to read in Hebrews. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love. Say love. love. Say motivate. motivate. Come on. And good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. Here we go. Let's read from but on. Ready? One, two, three. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Friends, it, it, what we are going to talk about over the next couple of weeks as we engage with this, the heart of friendship biblically, God's heart for friendship, in the midst of maybe for some of us where friendship has been a sore spot, where it's been tense, where there's been disappointment and offense and hurt, but if you show me your friends, I can show you your future. If you show me your friends, I can almost show you your future. And when Hebrews is writing to this community of believers, there's this encouragement to motivate one another to not give up on meeting together, but to encourage each other towards acts of love and good works. But if they don't have one another, it becomes very difficult to do so. You know, my wife mentioned it last week when Peter gets out of the boat, and he's the only one that gets out of the boat, and she asked a question, and I thought it was so powerful, I thought about it even more this week. How far would Peter have got if others would have gotten out of the boat with him? Totally hypothetical question. There's not a whole lot of exegesis or biblical scholarship on that moment. But I just wonder, if it was just Peter and he got that far, what if it was Peter, James, and John? Could he have gotten a little bit further? What if it was the other disciples coming up? What if even Judas puts the money bags aside and he gets out of the boat and helps his friend? How much further can we go? If you show me your friends, I can show you your future. Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. Now, we see that picture throughout Proverbs. We have the wise man and the fool and all of these things. But the walk with the wise, become wise. Look, if you want to be smarter, hang out with smarter people. If, if you want to be nicer, hang out with some nice people. Yeah. You want to be fit, don't hang out with people that are having a marathon eating Twinkies all day long. <laughs> hang out with people who are valuing their health, and they're going to help show you how to do that. You walk with the wise, become wise. But if you are a companion of fools, you'll suffer harm. I get challenged when I have friends that are asking the right questions to the wrong people. How should I continue in my marriage when all they have are people that don't value marriage, or they don't value commitment the way that they do? Well, sometimes we ask the right questions to the wrong people. And if you show me your friends, the Bible says that we can almost interpret our future. 
So the Hebrews, in this, in this moment right here in the book of Hebrews, there's a lot going on. The author is trying to really elevate Jesus above all else. He's like, look, you guys have a lot of sacrifices, you have a lot of forms of worship, but Jesus is better than all of them. It doesn't matter. If you sacrifice to sheep, he is the lamb of God. He took away the sin of the world. If you have priests and you have all these guys that used to carry out all of these religious activities, Jesus is the best priest there ever was. But this community is facing some persecution. They're facing persecution presently. They probably face some before this moment, and they're anticipating more. Some were getting scared and they're getting discouraged. This whole little Christian community is surrounded by a larger community of traditional Jewish believers who were not in line with the new Christian community. Not only that, they're surrounded by this other giant force called the Roman Empire, where it's very, very interesting. Because they only believed in one God, the Romans would have called them the atheists. Can you believe that? We have a hundred gods. You're going to say there's only one? I I find your lack of faith disturbing. Darth Vader. (laughs) Come on, you guys okay? You guys awake this morning? 844, I promise we're going to get out on time. It's okay. Some are getting discouraged. I'm just just trying to make sure people are like, wait, wait, what? what?" Write that down. (laughs) Write Darth Vader in your notes right now. Okay? The author is encouraging the truth of Christ being lived out in real friendship. And here's what they didn't have time for. They didn't have time for surface friendships. They didn't have time for convenient relationships. They needed people who were going to be there. It says this, that the Greek word for keep gathering, it says motivate one another towards acts of love and don't stop meeting together. Keep gathering. Well, the, the... The emphasis in the translation of that Greek word is this, and it's only used two times in the Bible, and it's to meet physically with a spiritual purpose. To meet face-to-face, heart-to-heart, with intention. Can we say that about our gatherings? Are we meeting with intention with one another? And it doesn't mean that we have to solve the world's problems when we get together for the potluck, but just that the intention would be just a little bit deeper in friendship a little bit more willing to be open and connect. See, there is power in presence. So while 25% of Americans would say that they, only, they don't even have one good close friend, today the average American only has two close friends. Average American only has two close friends. Now, that could be a subjective definition. What do you mean by close friends? Let's just say the kind of person that knows everything about you and you feel safe with that information being out there. Knows who you are, knows your family, knows your heart, your motivations. If you were to say something, they know your heart. They can interpret that right off the bat. You know, 25 years Earlier, the average American had six close friends. Six close friends. What happened in 25 years? What happened in 25 years that we go from six close friends to only having two to many of us not even feeling like we have any? There's a challenge that we're facing today. Here's what I want you to do, and it's it's in your notes. It's right here. I want you to list your closest friends. Take time. Take a moment. Some of you got pens. I want to hear them. Are we writing them down? Someone in the back hasn't even opened their notes. That's okay. (laughs) Open them now. Put some names down. And don't put your dog. Come on. (laughs) Some of you did. Some of you put the dog down. Stop it, okay? Someone put the cat, okay? No. Don't put your wife right now. I'm talking friend. Don't put your husband, okay? Close, close friends. And granted, we want husbands and wives to be BFFs forever, okay? But who are those people? Can you fill out the list? Can you put one or two or three? See, we are the average of our five closest friends. We're just about the average of our five closest friends. Usually the statistics will tell us that the five people we hang around the most or who influence the most, and we end up in the average. We may not be the richest in the group or the poorest in the group. We're somewhere in the middle. Maybe some of you are the brokest in the group, and that's okay too, okay? They still like having you around, okay? 
So, so we're the average. So what does that say about us if we consider who those people are? And we should consider who those people are. We should consider if there's a vacuum. And if friendship is struggling, then how then can I be a good friend? So it's not just, we don't want to take this sort of, uh, I want everybody to figure it out for me so that I can have all the friends that I need to achieve my dreams. A better question would be, how can I be the kind of friend that would bless and honor and motivate another person towards love and good works? How can I be the kind of friend that would attract that kind of friendship towards me as well? How can I be that? Well, here's the, uh, the Facebook version of Proverbs 1717. 17. It's in your notes. A friend is someone you may or may not know very well, but who accepts your friend request on Facebook in Jesus' name. This person is born, they are born, bred, and designed to like and comment on your posts to make you feel good about yourself and say things like, yes, girl. <laughs> they are the ones that you can count on when you do the throwback Thursday to when you were seven years old and you were so cute. And they can just say, so cute, on the comment thread. You got a homie from back in the day in college or a friend from school, and they're going to tell you you look good. You look like a stud. Did you lose weight? No, but thank you. <laughs> no, that's not the real version of 1717 in Proverbs. That's the Facebook version. Fortunately, it's the one that we live out, though. See, a friend, a true friend, if we we're going to friendship, if we we're going to define friendship, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Yeah. Say adversity. Come on, it's easy to have friends when you're winning. Everybody likes a winner. Why do you think so many people bandwagon jump on football teams all day long? Because everybody likes a winner. Look, I've been a Lakers fan forever, but when Golden State was winning, I was tempted. I, hey, I'm closer to Oakland than I, growing up than I was to L.A. I mean, I could just say, I've always been a Golden State Warriors fan. Except my closest friends would be like, fake news. You have no idea who is on that team. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, I like the Dodgers. I couldn't tell you one player on that team. I don't know what that says about me, but I know that my wife is a Giants fan and it annoys her. So we're going to keep that dynamic going. <laughs> a friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for a time of adversary. adversity. Now, who, who is your friend that's going to be there for your adversity? Who, who is the friend that when, when you lost your job, they're going to be there in adversity? Who is the friend where you've offended them, like you legitimately offended, you hurt their feelings, you disrespected them, but who is the friend that can be there with you in your moment of weakness? Who are you to that person. Are you there for friends? Sometimes it, it, we're, we're there, but then when we get offended and, and they were close, sometimes it's like, oh, but no way. We're, and then we, we're, we're just out. We don't want to deal with people anymore. But a true friend was born for a time of adversity and challenge. I love when my friends celebrate me and I love to celebrate friends. But the true test of friendship is often passed or failed in the season of adversity. You show me your friends, I can show you your future. You show me who the five people, who are your top five that you hang out with, and you can pretty much average yourself around with those people. And what you might find is if you're defining reality, there's some things that you might want to change. There's some things that you might want to enhance. So then what do we do? rediscovering the lost art of friendships. I think it's very simple. I think while we have a lot of dynamics that we're dealing with, like even those increasing the work hours, the busyness, maybe we have a lot of friends, but we just don't have time for them. But I think it really boils down to presence and openness. 
See, a, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. So what? We got to be present. God, we have to be present for one another, family. Presence requires time. It requires that face-to-face. See, I, I remember it, my wife shared it a little bit where when we, were, when we were pregnant the first time and then we lost that baby and then my friend called and said, hey man, how did the doctor's appointment go not knowing that we didn't, that we didn't have a good report, we had a bad report. And immediately he hung up the phone after we explained what had happened. Next thing I know, he lived just a few houses up. He and his wife, they figured, they got like eight kids of their own. I think I have four or five kids, you know. But they figured out, they had somebody watch those kids. They came, walked down, three houses down. They didn't knock on the door. They opened the door. They didn't say, hey guys, we're here. They walked up the stairs to our room where Tara and I were crying and trying to comfort one another. And they sat down with us and they just wept. They just cried with us, fam. And I, I don't know, I couldn't have told you a better response to that moment of adversity than what they did for us. See, it's one thing when your friends say, I'm going to be praying for you. Oh, but it's a whole different thing when somebody says, oh, no, I'm coming over because I'm going to pray with you. Amen? Come on, I think we need more people saying, we're going to pray with you, then I'm going to pray for you. Hey, you have 30 minutes or an hour for coffee. Where are you? I'm going to be over. Let me put the kids to bed and we'll figure it out. I want to pray with you while I'm praying for you. Come on, presence is huge. So that's what Jesus did, right? He didn't say, hey, you guys, follow me and I will make you professionals at this Old Testament book. Follow me and I'll make you really smart and to know really super spiritual answers about all of life's questions. No, he said, follow me, be with me, be present with me. And then they would walk from town to town and they would have critical conversations wherever they went. Be present. See, presence, that can kind of be subjective too. But here's what we know. Here, here's what you can definitively know about this sense of presence. You either are present or you are not. And kids know the difference. And our husbands and our wives know the difference. And our friends and our family know the difference when we're trying to have a dinner, but instead of even looking at the menu, we're looking at our digital devices. When instead of being able to have that, that sacred time of dinner at home with family, just not even to, to, to teach the most uh, amazing lessons about life, but just simply to ask the question, what was your best part of your day and what was the worst? What happened that was really, really cool? What happened that was kind of meh? Man, those questions are so important because then they feed into other questions and answers. Be present. No words necessarily. And secondly, we've got to be open, I think. Being open. You know, right now there is an increasing fear in, 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 the, in Western culture. And it's the fear, this is documented research, it's the fear of talking on the phone. Someone's laughing, but it's true. It's the fear of talking on the phone. And you know why I know it's true? How many of you screened a phone call this week? <laughs> Come on, how many of us are like, mm, nope, forward, or just, you're not going to do, you're not gonna do, do your friend dirty like that. You're not going to hit, a, hit, hit d decline the call. You're just going to let it ring. You're going to hit that side button on your phone, let it go quiet. And then you're going to let them do the voicemail. You're going to listen, and then you're going to determine, how do I respond in this moment? <laughs> no, there's like three people that did that this week. No. <laughs> See, and one of the reasons that that is true, is, and it's not just on the phone, but it's face-to-face, -face, it's because we can't control the outcome. Digital communication gives us the ability to control the context I get to control if I block you, if I unblock you, if I respond or not. I get to determine if I want to talk to you while I'm sitting for an appointment at the doctor or if I don't want to talk to you at all. 
We don't control the outcome in live conversation. And there's an increasing fear and an anxiety in that place, which contributes to the challenge of being truly open. Because if I'm open, then how will people react to me? You know, 12 dudes walking the earth together with Jesus, they had to have known like every intimate detail about one another. Like who had the worst toenails? You know, like stuff like that. Like, like who snored the worst at camp? You know what I mean? Like, like they were so close and connected to one another. Like there couldn't be much that they didn't no, and yet I fear that even in our most intimate small groups or Bible studies, that sometimes we still don't know one another. Because how, how, could, that, how could we not know that that was going on? How could we not know that that happened or that was brewing in our heart? Have we become so professional at communicating our digital persona in a present context? We impress, here's the thing is, we impress each other with our strengths. We do, and, and, and our strengths, they're good, they spur each other on. But we, while we impress each other with our strengths, we connect with people in our weakness. It's not in my strength that I truly connect with people. It's in that moment when I'm like, wait a minute, I, I just told you that I yelled at my kid this week and, and you struggled with yelling at your kid this week? Us? We? Me too? Like, like you get frustrated at traffic too? Like you, you don't have a great relationship with your in-laws either? Like, like pick the scenario and there's that moment where we can connect and say, by the way, I have a great relationship with my in-laws. I just want to point that out. <laughs> some, some, of, some of you guys are like, oh my gosh, he just let that out of the bag. Oh man, I hope, I hope they're doing okay. <laughs> Calm down. Okay, we're fine. <laughs> That's why James 5.16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can be healed. We don't want to miss out on the opportunity to be known, but it's scary to be known. And I want to tell you that, that some of us have tried to be known, maybe even in our church, and you got hurt. And I want to tell you I'm sorry. I want to tell you that, that for the most part, our, our intent is not to abuse or to dishonor a sacred, honest moment. That's why I say very confidently, we will not do it perfect at New Hope Hawaii Kai. Just look, because if you're looking for the perfect church, this ain't it. And by the way, if you're looking for the perfect church, you're probably not invited either. <laughs> I'm going to let that one sink in for a little bit. Like that, that church meets somewhere secretly on some high mountain. <laughs> and they, they say awesome Hawaiian prayers, and it's just so full of spirit. It's everything that you want, but you're not, and I'm not invited to. So we'll just keep doing our imperfect church here, okay? Is that okay? Can we do that? <laughs> we connect in our weaknesses. And, I, and it hurts when I fail. It hurts when I fail people. It hurts when I fail you as a church. It hurts when, when I fail my wife. It, it hurts, but in that moment, we can realize that, that if we have friends, if, 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 we, if I show you my friends, you could, you could tell my future, that in that moment where I can say you too, because I felt that way. You were mad about that too, because I was mad about that. How do, we, how do we spur each other on to love and good works? Amen? How do we do this thing where instead of when we get mad and then we run from community? So that's what happens, fam, and it, it's such a tragedy that I don't know what it is. Sometimes our expectations get, get ahead of us and, and they get broken or, or our disappointment, and then we run from the very community that we will find our healing in. And I do not pretend to say that that process is easy, but it's how God designed it. Now, I've seen people reinvent themselves with new groups of friends. 
a new company, a new church. But the thing is, is if we don't deal, if we're not present and we're not open, we just take ourselves wherever we go. I have guys that know everything about me. They saved my life. I have met, I, you know, I... <laughs> Pastor Carl and Pastor Jay and Pastor Calvin, I, I don't know what they don't know about me. And if they were ever to ask, I would tell them. Because in order for me to walk out my freedom in Christ, I need them. And, and I have a, another, my brother, he's my best friend. We've done some crazy, awesome, dumb things together over our life. But I'll tell you, when I have some things going on, I call my brother, I call Adam, or I call a mentor, or I call Chris, or I call Duke. There's this collection of men that I can't be so present with them, but there are ways to be connected so that I am present and open. There are ways that we can cultivate friendship. That's why I want to encourage you. If you can join a small group, join one. I just want to encourage you. Look, you're not going to find every answer to life's issues on our Sunday morning service. I would encourage you, jump into the rhythm of our life at New Hope Hawaii Kai. Join a small group. Be a part of a ministry. Get connected and take, maybe you're not ready to get fully open on that, but just take one next step of openness and just watch God, watch what he can do. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Now, if you don't have friends, it's difficult to live out the future that God intended for you. And maybe you're thinking, well, I don't really have the right friends. And, and, and those are moments that we have to come to terms with. Sometimes those friends are new friends that we've engaged with. Sometimes those are friends that we've been with. We've been in the same routine and the same habit for 20, 30 years. But if we look and we evaluate where we are in Christ, we know that maybe there are some changes that need to take place. Well, we got to pray and ask God to help find them. Maybe we do have the right friends. If you, you filled out the list, someone fill out the, somebody didn't fill out this list. Come on, fill it out today. Come on, make sure this is filled out or it's empty. And if it's empty, start praying. Start asking Jesus for those people. Maybe you could have 10 people on this list. You have all the friends, but you have none of the time for them. Then we start asking God to give us ways that we can be present and open. If our friends can often be an insight into our future, then let's seek out our best future by seeking out friends that point us to Jesus. Amen? Amen. 